We've now spent some time studying galaxies, but we have to admit that we just don't understand how galaxies are formed and go through their various stages in the detail that we understand the stars. So they're significantly more mysterious. And some galaxies manifest strange and very extreme behavior. Of course, the stars do too. But galaxies have their own particular set of strange behaviors. And this goes under the title active galaxies. So let's investigate what we mean by an active galaxy. And we'll discover that supermassive black holes play a significant role in the manifestation of these behaviors. So the active galactic nuclei correspond to those galaxies that are emitting prodigious quantities of energy from their core. The brightest variations of this phenomena go by the term quasars, which emit as much as a thousand times the energy of the Milky Way. And those very brightest ones go by the titles BL lock objects and blazars, all these fancy terms. Now, quasars are a temporary stage, and they're only found at great distances. Therefore, it corresponds to the early development of the galaxy. Vast distances corresponds to vast ages. So, vast ages, or long ages ago, means that the galaxies were young. The details, again, are not clear as to everything going on, but they seem to be, this, this developmental phase seems to be connected with their development, the growth of the galaxies. And we'll find out that the, the, the central engine driving all this is nestled deep within the core of the galaxies. In addition to quasars and BL lock objects and blazars, we have safer galaxies and radio galaxies. And that's the essential complement of the active galactic nuclei. So quasars is the term given to the more broad or longer definition of the of the term quasi stellar objects why well because they tend to look like distant stars so it turns out they're not stars so quasi stellar here's an example 3c273 there is a quasar nestled deep in this galaxy they sometimes are associated with strong radio waves. Here in this example, we have a radio lobe coming off of here. Very interesting. The variability of their light can be on the order of months, days, or even hours, the time for the variability. And that has implications for the size of the object that's producing the change in light. They manifest strange emission lines. And part of that strangeness is associated with Doppler shifted hydrogen bomber lines. It took a long time to figure this out because the shift is so massive. In fact, in this case, it was found to have a 16% redshift. Now that's really huge when we're talking about redshift because it actually corresponds to a percentage of the speed of light. So this quasar measures to be receding away from us at 16% of the speed of light, also corresponding to the 16% redshift. That means it's 3 billion light years away. This is cosmological distances. And that's pretty surprising based on the fact that it looks like a star in our Milky Way galaxy, say. So it's very deceptive as to what it really is. Emitting 10 to the 39 watts or a trillion solar luminosities. So many times the energy of the Milky Way galaxy. And the light that they produce tends to wash out the light that they're, that, of the galaxy that they're part of. Since they're so powerful, the galaxy itself that it's nestled in may not be clearly seen. The light emission is quite odd, not just the fact that it's severely redshifted, but compared to other galaxies, the type of emission is strange as well. And just to clarify, the vast distances corresponding to the huge redshift associated with these things. The speed of the quasars is 6% to 90 plus percent the speed of light, and that corresponds to these huge redshifts. So here's the hydrogen alpha emission line, and it's redshifted so much it's in the infrared. 
So that's how much redshift there is. Likewise for the other Balmer series emissions. And over on this graph, we have the relative number of quasars versus time since the Big Bang. So we see it peaking at about 2 billion years after the origin of the universe itself. And then the rate at which we see the quasars based on their redshifts, which gives an indication of its distance and time, drops off fairly rapidly. So in recent billions of years, no quasars. The distances then are almost across the observable universe. When we see quasars, we're looking typically a half to nine tenths or more of the distance through the limits of the observable universe. And the large variations in brightness, which can be as small as ours, limits the max size because nothing can vary in its intensity faster than it takes a beam of light to travel across that entity. Therefore, if the brightness variation is one hour, the maximum size of that object producing the variation can be one light hour in extent. It's an important thing to keep in mind. So as mentioned, the light itself is odd. Let's take a look at that now. So quasars, quasi-stellar radio objects, and just quasi-stellar objects that don't emit strong radio are emitters of radiation that is very unique unto themselves. So we recognize that galaxies typically emit very strongly and visible, but not so much across the spectrum. Quasars are emitting strongly and strangely from radio through gamma. We don't have good data here. And up here in the infrared, that's a uh, characteristic of not so much the quasi-stellar radial sources, but just the quasi-stellar objects, which are strong emitters throughout the rest of the spectrum. So they kind of go hand in hand. They're both quasi-stellar objects, but quasi-stellar radio objects, quasars in particular, are strong in the radio. It's about 10%. Most of the quasi-stellar objects are relatively weak in the radio. A little confusing perhaps, don't worry about it too much. So quasars should contain matter that has a wide range of temperatures to produce this wide variation in emission wavelengths. Now they're very hard to study because they're so distant. However, there are similar active galactic nuclei galaxies closer to home, which we'll investigate momentarily. Now, even though the quasars themselves are a little bit hard to study, when we find them, we can investigate the imprint they make on the clouds that the light passes through. So we can use the quasars to study the intergalactic medium in the intervening vast regions of space from the quasar to Earth. The light has to pass through the cosmos, and in so doing, there may be multiple clouds along the way and each cloud leaves its own unique imprint in the spectra so clouds that are very deep like here will absorb light but it also be red shifted so you can see that imprint a particular wavelength and red shifted a certain amount and cloud number two cloud number three etc leaves its own imprint so the particular <coughs> absorption lines that are observed can also, in addition to the fact that you can uh, understand what the clouds are made out of from that, you also know their location because the redshift will reveal that. So that's a pretty useful feature of utilizing the information from quasars to study the, the universe. And about 1% of nearby galaxies have emissions that look similar to quasars, but less energetic than the quasars themselves. And these are the Seyfert galaxies. Seyfert galaxies have a very luminous and small nucleus. You'll notice in this image, if I ask you what's one difference between this image and other galaxy images you might have seen, and I would guess you might say, gee, it looks like the core of that galaxy is extra bright, and you would be right. 
very peculiar spectra coming from this, not normal, highly ionized atoms. That corresponds to very excited hot gas, also low density, and broad spectral lines. That corresponds to large velocities, so you have lots of red shifting, broadening the spectral lines, but that's also consistent with hot excited gas. To the extent that it's moving at 10,000 kilometers per second, which is 30 times faster than regular galaxy speeds of the gas in the center region. So this is very unique and different. The Seyfert's make up about 2% of the spirals that are out there. And the variation in the luminosity of that core is seen to change by as much as 70% the luminosity of our entire galaxy. Many billions of solar luminosities, 70% of that in only a few weeks. Now that's hard to imagine coming from the core of one galaxy, that it could change 70% the luminosity of the entire galaxy in just a few weeks. Well, that small core can emit 100 times more power than the entire galaxy. That too is hard to imagine. So, these are very strange objects that certainly get our attention. And now we move on to radio galaxies. This particular example here is known as a double radial source. You might kind of see why. You see some symmetry. There's a galaxy located between two radio emitting regions. So here's the galaxy and the vast quantities of energy associated with this is coming from these radio lobes, not from the core itself. So that's significantly different than what we just saw in the Seyferts. Cygnus A is a very well studied radio galaxy, a double radial source. Notice the lobes on both sides, those are radio lobes with a active central galaxy. That's very misleading in terms of the scale of things here. The high speed gas from the central galaxy inflates the lobes through these radio jets. And as I said, the scales are misleading. This is 100,000 light years. This is the scale of our own Milky Way galaxy. That's how big this lobe is. This is a galaxy. The central region itself is a few light hours across. Now, considering that this is 100,000 light years, this being a few light years, a few light hours, it's much smaller than this dot indicates. It's just so bright it saturates the detectors, but it would be much smaller than the eye could see at this scale. So from that small source, you're producing prodigious quantities of radio emission. That's a manifestation of high speed jets of particles being lobbed into the interstellar medium and producing these huge emissions of light as those particles ram into the, uh, you could also call it the intergalactic medium gas. Now, in our discussion of the active galactic nuclei, accretion disks seem to be a common factor. Here is Centaurus A, an amazing image, multiple wavelength image of an active galaxy. So the accretion disk is clearly seen here. This is a very rare galaxy that can be studied in such detail. It consists of visual radio and x-ray of this galaxy. You see the large radial lobes coming out the ends here, very clearly seen. These lobes are associated with significant radio emission, which is produced by high-speed electrons circling around the lobes, producing what's called synchrotron radiation. I'll address that a little bit more shortly. Here is a visible light image of the galaxy. So we've actually seen this before. That's visible light. Notice that dust band going across there. It's actually part of the accretion disk. So we have X-ray. You can see tremendous quantities of X-ray emission. That's part of this galaxy. And it all really comes from the center, the center hotspot of X-ray emission. Also radio continuum. That's just the part of the continuous spectrum that's in the radio, in the black body radio the black body spectrum, the radio part of that. So that's where the lobe energy 
is significantly seen. And the 21 centimeter, the 21 centimeter emission line as well. So that makes up part of this region around the accretion disk. Well, if we look a little more detail in the very center and take radio and x-ray, we see radio in, in red and x-ray in blue around here. And so this is a both x-ray and radio plume coming out of the center, this active galactic nucleus. Now, jets of energy is, have also been seen around protostars, neutron stars, black holes, all of which have had accretion disks, as we have seen. So this is just like scaling the accretion disk up a few orders of magnitude to a galactic size ones, one. The jets themselves are most likely from matter falling into a central supermassive black hole, which then has the energy to spew those that, that material back out along these in an axial manner and producing the radio lobes that we see.